think you might, you might not applaud at the end. <laughs> Apparently, I picked a topic that was really interesting to a lot of you yeah. in Black History Month. Why not? So, thank you for welcoming me. First of all, thank you to all who stopped by to welcome me to Tioga County. Yes, I still live in Broome County. Sorry. <laughs> it's my parents' house, and my wife and I live in the basement. <laughs> and we send Star Trek emails to William Shatner. Oh, no, that's another thing. <laughs> As you can tell, I don't take history. I take history seriously, but not that seriously. Uh, when I was running the local history center at the Broome County Library, they asked, what do you do? I said, I take care of dead people and dead things. <laughs> so then I moved over to Tioga County, and we take care of dead people and dead things. <laughs> but it tells a living story of history, and that's what I hope to do today. If you think I know everything about the Underground Railroad, you're absolutely wrong. This is a 30-some plus year study. Let's go follow the North Star. Oh, come on. There we go. The Underground Railroad in the Southern Tier. Now you're going to get the social studies lesson. Because that's what I always start with. What is the Underground Railroad? It's neither a railroad nor did it go underground. It was an organized effort to help fugitive slaves make their way toward freedom. By the way, the name Underground Railroad came from an escaped slave making his way through Ohio. This is after the Compromise of 1850, when the stipulations, if you were caught helping an escaped slave, were very strict. And with the slave owner and the sheriff in hot pursuit, crossed the creek and got to a safe house on the Underground Railroad. And he just seemingly disappeared. And the owner was quoted as saying, he must have found a mighty fast railroad that went underground. <coughs> That's the name. Yes. Well, they did this and they did that, but we'll get there. So let's talk about slavery in the United States. Maybe we will if I can hear my notes. There we go. So the first slaves to arrive came here in 1619. When I was teaching my local history class, I love to point out that's a year before the Pilgrims. Mm. So for those who want to join that, that's some might have been here before. And as a typical illustration of a slave ship, as they would have literally, if you remember watching Roots, crammed them in the ships. Mm. Now, while predominantly in the southern states, please don't think of that as they used to say, the southern's peculiar institution. Slavery was also found in the north. Slavery was found in Tioga County, in Broome, in Shemont, throughout New York State, not to the degree or the same type. And many northern states abolished slavery between the period of 1780 and 1830. Can you hold on for one minute? Because I forgot to do one thing. <coughs> now the people are going to watch this. I'm going to miss part of the social studies lesson. <coughs> and typical engraving of a slave auction. Now, although the African slave trade was discontinued in 1808, and that's in quotes. Another quarter of a million slaves were brought here prior to the Civil War. It didn't, it slowed them up, it didn't stop. Total slave population before the Civil War was estimated at four million. And a wonderful photograph of a slave family, obviously of these being in the South. Now, the treatment of slaves depended on where they were located and what time period we're talking about. So as conditions got worse, as there were more slaves uh, toward the period of the Civil War, treatment sometimes got harsher because, frankly, the Southern economy couldn't support them anymore. There were actually too many the profit levels were going down and, and conditions got harsher. Constitutionally, for those who remember that thing, it, slaves were considered three-fifths of a person. Now why? 
Well, the southern states, during the time of the Constitution, one of them all counted as a whole person because the more people you had in your state, the more representatives you had in Congress, which gave you more power. The people in the North didn't want to count them because they wanted control, more control of the Congress. So they compromised, remember that word? <laughs> on three-fifths of a human being. But no legal rights. You were property. You could be beaten. You could be whipped. You could be murdered. No consequence. It's your property. It's like dropping a cup in the kitchen. Not quite the same thing, though. So slave families were often sold separately to maximize profits. So they would take the children away and sell them. Especially the girls were, this is going to sound crude, were good for breeding. It's a harsh way of looking at it, but it's the truth. And let's look at slavery at its worst. By the way, that's an engraving of two devices to keep the slave in control if they've been rebellious, which is the iron mask, uh, the leg irons, and the uh, apparatus around the neck. Slavery, especially in the plantation field life, rice plantations, cotton plantations, was harsh. Trouble pet slaves who attempted to show independence or run away were often confined in iron, whipped, or even lynched. And it was all legal. If those of you of a certain age bracket, of which most of you are who are here, you can always count on that, remember watching Roots on TV. And John Amos played the adult Kutikinte, or Toby. And he ran away, if you remember, they brought him back and they chopped off half his foot. Not an unusual occasion. Run away, run away home, an ad advertising for people to be on the lookout for an escaped slave and gives you the description. Nothing unusual. If you think that's a southern ad, that's from the southern tier. Mm -hmm. wow. The first one I found is dated from 1812. In an issue of what would later become, well actually it's the newspaper that became the American Constellation, which became the Oigo Gazette. Mm -hmm. That's when you guys were part of Rural County, before we gave you that. <laughs> I still don't know why, but we did. But it was a, we bought issues, the very, some of the very first issues of the newspaper, and in there was an ad for a runaway slave, giving all the particulars of the description and the, and the reward. And then the next week is the ad, next issue, saying, never mind, he's been recovered. So incidents of slaves escaping their masters go back almost as far as the institution of slavery itself. In those early years, Slaves escaped with little help. They just were on their own. There was no real formal organization or individuals for them to go to. And I misspoke. The date was actually 1850 for the runaway slave. And that's a wonderful of a we actually group of runaway slaves, that's not here, that's as they made their way through Ohio. Ohio was a hotbed of abolitionist activity that that engraving was taken from. Efforts to organize people to assist the runaway slaves began with the Society of Friends, or as we may more properly remember them, the Quakers, starting in 1810. Other active churches involved in abolition and underground railroad included Baptists and Methodists. I would love to say that every religion was fervently anti-slavery. No. In fact, in some communities, we'll get to Elmira shortly, it splits the congregation in two. So some religions didn't take a strong stand, either pro or against. Then we had groups who thought they would come up with the answer, like the American Colonization Society. 
It was another attempt to solve the issue of slavery, but aided whites more than blacks. American Colonization Society answer was, we're going to take all the slaves, all the blacks, we're going to cram them on ships and send them back to Africa. Except they forgot they've been here for 150 years, and there were a few more now than there were when they came over. I always love the groups that have one answer when there's 20. So let's go to the North Star. The Underground Railroad gradually became a series of what they would call stations, since it was a mighty fast railroad, run by station masters or conductors. These were people sympathetic to the movement. Uh, they would send the slaves on to the next stop and make their way toward freedom. And you're seeing a map I stole from the National Geographic. Because I'll be honest, a lot of this research started as a college student back in a decade that I don't want to name. But I was really young and sucking up to the professor to get a good grade. <laughs> Apparently, I did a good job, I got an A. Um, but it's a great map showing some of the routes from the South and how they converge either in New Philadelphia or the New York area, New York City area, and then further on through the Northeast. Many of these routes ran through Philadelphia, and some of them north along the land or sea. There were a few cases of escaped slaves hiding on board a ship and getting toward the north. The trouble with that is, if you're found out, well, there's several solutions to that. Slaves would make their way toward Canada. Why? Because in Canada, they were treated as equal, legal, and moral to the whites. So of course they're bringing the head there because it was a much more accepting society. Others would stay where they felt safe, whatever that was deemed to be from capture. We're going to talk about a few of those today. That's a far less number than those that made their way toward the Canadian border. Now, routes on the Underground Railroad. Slaves would follow traditional landmarks, such as rivers or the North Star. That's why I follow the North Star. Others could be smuggled on trains, boats. One, or actually no, two that I know of even boxed themselves up in crates and had themselves mailed north. That's pretty good. In fact, um, he was, his name was Henry, and he went on a lecture circuit after the Civil War, saying how he survived. One woman did it, but she didn't survive very long. Conditions weren't right. So, if you think about it, you're wondering why would they undertake it, because it was their only way out. Now, you have to be realized that these conductors would only be given directions to the next stop or maybe the stop beyond that. Why? Helping people, abetting the runaway slaves was an illegal activity. If you were caught, you could be put in prison, you could be fined heavily. So it was a risk. And also, if you only knew the one, one or two stops, and there were usually secondary stops, you couldn't give away the whole route, even if they caught you at it. So it was a means of protecting the whole operation. Now that's very common. A lot of us learned about her in social studies class back somewhere when we were still using abacuses and slate. <laughs> Maybe that's just me. She was born a slave, but made an escape and made a way, and her home is in Auburn. New York. Uh, she risked her freedom and went back 19 times to bring back slaves, freeing over 600 slaves. You, how many of you have heard of Harriet Tubman? How many of you have heard of Jermaine Logan? Thank you, Ed. <laughs> I knew I'd get one hand. While she is celebrated 
there are people who actually were more active than she. By the way, she carried a pistol with her on her way back and threatened to use it several times. I don't think she did. So badges, badges, we don't need no stinking badges. <laughs> Sorry. Little, little Humphrey Bogart interjection there. And the slave master whipping the slave. Efforts to stem the flow of runaways resulted in the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. There had been an earlier one in 1820, didn't succeed. 1850 was much more strict. There were five parts to the Compromise of 1850, and I'm not going to go through them, mainly because I forget some of them along the way. But persons could be imprisoned or fined severely. By severely, I mean upwards of $10,000 in 1850 dollars. Now, the act, act backfired. Why? Well, it's like when you tell your daughter she can't go out with that guy for her boyfriend. Wait, that's me. <laughs> and then she does it anyway. In fact, she does it, she wants to do it even more. Uh, I, I relate it to my Irish temperament, where my mother said my first word out of my mouth should have been no. Well, you told these people who were fervent in their belief of abolition and the right to help the slaves that they're in trouble if they get caught. And I think they pointed a certain finger at the federal government <laughs> and said, no, we're going to do it even more. We're going to get more people involved. So it totally backfired. The Underground Railroad got huge. So now let's get to our area. That is the home in Montrose of Judge Eisenhost. I told you that it was dangerous. Most of the stories we're going to talk about are based on research, oral history, and folklore, <clears throat> proving, absolutely proving, the stop when the person was involved in the Underground Railroad is extremely difficult. At one point, the federal government had this big effort to get us to create routes and document everything, and they wanted it done to national park standards. We couldn't do it. So you all probably either think you own a stop on the Underground Railroad, you know there's a stop on the Underground Railroad, you heard there was a stop on the Underground Railroad. Somebody's got a tunnel. Ooh. An attic. A bar. Somebody told somebody who told somebody who told somebody. And that's part of the problem, is trying to get back as far as we can to document. This is one of the few written cases that we know of. So after Philadelphia or Harrisburg, the slaves make their way up toward north toward New York State. Many would stay in the Montrose area. This is Judge Post. He let a large number of people stay in his house, both white and black, who were assisting. Why do we know his house was used? Because he wrote it down in his diary. Why wasn't he arrested? Because he was the judge. <laughs> and here come the judge. And nobody bothered him. But that's a rare circumstance. Other slaves would go toward Elmira and we go. Oh, wait, that's where we are. <laughs> Reaching New York. As slaves crossed over the border in the New York State, they were greeted with three counties that had varying degrees of acceptance for the slaves. Most active of the three I'm going to talk about is Shimon County. If you like the map, I drew it for my paper I did for the professor. <laughs> I told you I sucked up. It was the best I could do given the research. By the way, this research on this was the first time I was ever in this building. And I was only two years old at all oh, no, that's not. <laughs> Can't get away with that anymore. So you can see 
some of the routes. That's sort of supposed to be Binghamton and Elmira and Oviedo would be right sort of in between. In Elmira, we know there was at least 100 people known to be involved in the Underground Railroad. And I'll tell about this gentleman in a moment. It's led by the Reverend Thomas Beecher. That name sounds very familiar. That's the brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. He had been there leading a church congregation which literally split over the issue of slavery. Uh, activity focused around John W. Jones. Oh, by the way, Mark Twain's in-laws were also involved in the Underground Railroad at the time. Now, this is John W. Jones. i to make sure. Why is he important? He was supposed to be born a slave. He wasn't. Oh, hang on. I was flying around the chapter there for a moment. He wasn't born a slave. He might have been bored, but he was born a slave. My apologies. In Maryland, made his way north in the very early 1800s. He settled in Elmira and began to assist runaway slaves because he wanted to be part of it. Why is he important? There's his house. Not much. Started out with one room and grew to two. Wow. But it was next to the Erie Railroad tracks. In the slave, you're going to follow a traditional route. I mentioned that. You're going to follow a river. You're going to follow a railroad. By the way, you travel at night. You don't travel in the daytime. The likelihood of an unknown black individual making his way through this area and not being thought suspicious was very low. So you travel at night and you go from stop to stop. His was next to the railroad. They would hide in his house as many at one time as he had 17 people in the one room in his house. That's crammed in. And then smoke it on board at 2 o'clock in the morning on board the Erie Railroad train. It stopped in Elmira. And that, at that point, was their last stop before they hit St. Catharines, Ontario. Did the railroad individuals, so the people working there, knowing this was happening? Yes. Did they stop it? No. Now, I'm sure they could have gotten in trouble too, but it was a very excellent method of getting a large number of escaped slaves to freedom. And Jones was instrumental in that working. You have to remember, in almost 85 to 90 percent of the cases, the conductors are white. They are not black. Why? Because the black churches and the black individuals are going to be the first one thought to be suspected of this activity. Oh look, oh we go to a we go. And they're not talking about the car that was made here. So slaves who crossed the border into Tioga County meant a much smaller black population. The black population of Shabon County at that time was a little over 2%. Doesn't sound like much, but in terms of total percentage of ethnic groups make up, it was fairly high. Population base in Tioga, out of a total population of 21,000, you had 230 African Americans, or about 0.73% of the total population, much smaller. Unlike Elmira and Binghamton, there were no African American churches, per se, before the Civil War. Remember I said before. Now here's where everybody's going to dispute what I'm going to say. Don't use me. I did the best I could many years ago. There's at least five sites listed in some sources. The accounts of the Underground Railroad and published sources are few and far between, although a lot of the historic societies like Canada and such have done a wonderful job starting to document the activity to the best of their abilities. Here's the sites that they documented back in a 1970s resource. 100 Front Street, 294 Front Street, 313 Front Street, 351 Front Street, and 351 Main Street. 
Most are mentioned in just one newspaper article, but two homes have more evidence than others. The first is 294 Front Street, which was owned by attorney William P. Warner, who moved to Wego in 1834. Their slaves may have entered the house through a tunnel. I know I said when they said a tunnel, it doesn't mean it's real. I lied. No. I exaggerated for effect. There are occasions, because his, his tunnel led up toward the riverbank, which would be a common landmark. In most instances, these tunnels that have been found were to bring ventilation into the kitchen, which was often in the basement of the house or outside what they used to call the summer kitchen. The other reason was a spill. <laughs> Amazingly, in Tioga County, like in every other county during Prohibition, people had stills and speakeasies, and they hid them. Sometimes better than others, sometimes not so well, because it's amazing how everybody always knew where they could find the moonshine. <laughs> and maybe they still do. The second location is that of the Thomas Farrington home there at 351 Front Street. The escaped slaves there were hidden in the attic. And that's a fairly assured documentation by family stories after the war, at the Civil War. Now, from there they would leave a we go, and in a lot of instances they head up toward Candor. When they get to Candor, they're going to follow basically what's Route 96 now. So you can sort of visualize, I didn't stick in a graphic because I thought, you guys know where it is. <laughs> I have a folding map in my desk downstairs that they had to help me with. And thanks to someone who called who couldn't make it because it's her daughter's, her granddaughter's birthday party today. Yeah, and went north through Waverly, western side of Tioga County. And then continued north through the town of Spencer. Why? Because it's going to head up and crook a little bit to the west and head toward Ithaca. And that's a major stop on the Underground Railroad. And there, supposed to be there, see what happens when you change your graphic type fast? They didn't tell me I had to type correctly when they hired me. There they would stop at places like the home of Lyman Bradley Sr. For those from Spencer, it's also known as the Helen Myers House, who told the subsequent owner who now lives in there that they used to smuggle slaves in there, probably into the attic where there's a room with a lock is only on the outside. If you go in, you can't get out. Either that or they found my youngest daughter and put her away so she doesn't bother me. Oh, wait. Oh, she's 26 and she went away and then the pandemic hit. We're all still living in the same room. And sometimes we think we'll let her live. <laughs> they won't let us kill our children. They should sometimes. No. Okay, whose home was still stands today at 125 North Main Street, it was built in 1842. Those are local bricks built on the site, and it's the only brick residence in the town, the little hamlet of Spencer. And it's really cool looking. And I love our description. They do not know why they have a federal style doorway in a house built in 1842 when it's far too late. I know why. Because the guy who built the house knew how to build federal style houses. <laughs> that's why you find a Greek revival that's supposed to have been gone by the time of the Civil War still being built in the 1870s because the carpenter knew how to build them. My father was a carpenter then. They built a lot of split levels, not this one. Now, slaves would then move north to Ithaca. They would get and cross the Cayuga Lake toward the north on a steamship called the Simeon DeWitt. There's an engraving I found. It. Did they know they were being smuggled on? Yep, just like the Erie Railroad, but they did it anyway. And from there they would travel further north toward Canada. 
Now, I'd love to say I know every stop in Tioga County on the Underground Railroad. I don't. As I said, this has been a 35-year learning curve for me. I should tell you why, because I alluded to that before. My great-grandfather served in the Civil War. Yes, I said great-grandfather. He was only 14 at the time, but told me he was 21. He was shot in the head, but being a thick-headed Irishman that he was, they sent him back out two weeks later. <laughs> and then, during the Siege of Petersburg, defending what was Weldon Railroad to stop the supplies coming in for the Confederates, his commander took the entire regiment up the wrong road. And the entire regiment was captured, except for 10% of them, and thrown into Confederate prisoner war camps. He succeeded to make it through four. If you think that either one, Palmyra was the only instance, or Andersonville, almost all the prisoner war camps got to that condition by the end of the war. He was sent through four, each one got worse. At some point, at the last one down in North Carolina, he escaped. How did they escape? They were on the death detail. That means they would get those who could stand to drag the dead Union soldiers who died of disease or malnutrition or whatever out and they would dump the bodies into trenches. How many of you have ever been to a prisoner of war camp in the South? It's a very, there's nothing really left of the buildings. I stopped at one in Florence, South Carolina where the estimate is between seven and 14,000 dead. And they're buried in four very long trenches. So while they were out there, apparently he took off for the woods. And a slave family took him in, which was not uncommon. The slaves knew the war was coming toward a conclusion. They were courting favor with the Union soldiers. And they gave him food and shelter and then pointed him to the Union troops. Now, he finally made it back to his regiment. He was in Company K, 104th Regiment, New York Infantry. Where was it when he finally met up with his troops? He was at Appomattox. As Lee was coming to surrender to Grant. And then he came back home and forevermore he would lie about his age unless there was a circumstance. He, he didn't want the federal government to know what his real age was because he thought he would lose his pension. <laughs> Good thing, But, you know, uh, by the way, he was, in case you really care, he was in the 2nd Brigade. Of when my former student and I went through all the battlefields. This is during the pandemic. You could walk the battlefields without a mask because you're out in the open. And then we put our mask on, and we were the only ones at the Appomattox Courthouse. And this National Park Ranger said, you know what, Brigade? I said, 2nd Brigade, he's over there. They were guarding the Confederate. They knew where everybody was. I said, what have you seen, Lee or Grant? I said, no. Only a handful actually saw that. But I thought, hey, dummy, you joined a war, you got shot, you got caught. But thank God for those slaves who took him in and sent him on his way, which sparked my interest in the Underground Railroad, which gets me to my original county, which is Broome County. So slaves who left Montrose, was stop next to Binghamton. If you think about it, you go right over Pennsylvania Avenue. Okay. Some, are, some, like other areas, they found some resistance. Not everybody wanted escaped slaves making their way in. Some people, like this gentleman to the left, Senator Daniel S. Dickinson, our foremost politician who ended up being U.S. Senator for New York State, but coming from Binghamton, was a believer in states' rights. He was a states' rights Democrat which meant that they thought the state should have the right to choose whether they're going to be a free state or a slave state. Now, was he fervently abolitionist? No. But I will say this, when the war broke out, he gave over 1,500 speeches in support of the Union. And as a result, Daniel, um, First of all, Abraham Lincoln appointed him district attorney for what's now considered the Southern District of New York. And he moved to New York and he died there in 1866. By the way, he was nominated twice for the Democratic Party for the presidency. And he was nearly your 17th president. 
1864 election, Lincoln's running against General George McClellan. They have to, he, he dumps his original um, vice president, a man by the name of Nobody knows? Hannibal Hamlin. <laughs> that gets you a drink at most bars. <laughs> <laughs> and they needed a new one, and they suggested putting Dickinson on the ticket. He was popular with Clay and Webster. He'd been there during the Compromise of 1850. And they finally said no, because they thought he's a Democrat, he'll pull the ticket together. It sounds just like today, doesn't it? <laughs> There's a lot of similarities, folks. Except not as many guns out there right now. Uh, and instead they dumped him and took Senator Andrew Johnson, an illiterate tailor, but he was from the state of Tennessee, which was a border state. His wife, by the way, had to teach the upcoming president how to read and write. But that's kind of common in a lot of families. The wives are the smart ones. So, some remaining former slave owners, such as Joshua Whitney, you see here the power broker behind William Bingham's move in Binghamton, remained in the area. And both Dickinson and Whitney were founding members of Christ Episcopal Church. The Episcopalians, for those who are there, I apologize, were not fervently abolitionist. Methodists and the Baptists were. Some congregationals. The church often mentioned as a stop in the Underground Railroad, and I want to beat up the person who first mentioned that. You know, it's very easy to make a mistake. It's very hard to fix it once it's out there. Uh, as an underground railroad stop was not likely to have assisted the slaves. In fact, uh, another member of the church, this lovely sort of gropey looking man, was Dr. Tracy Robinson. His son, by the way, will be General John Robinson, who will later be head president of the GAR. He was the president of the American Colonization Society that I mentioned before. So all three of them were members of Christ Church, not likely. What the guy got mixed up is they found a little tiny room. Ooh, the slaves are all hidden in there, and they did this. No, it's where he went to fix the pipes on the organ. And it's only this wide. So he had to be a skinny slave, I guess. Now his group, as I said, was to send them back to Africa, and this went against the wishes of many of the area's free blacks, of which Broom County had a fairly good number. Not few, so. By 1838, Binghamton had two African-American churches. Although small and poor, they had assistance from white churches to survive. And these churches certainly assisted runaway slaves. That's a natural, but they also knew they were a target. They'd be the first place they were looking. We'll get to this gentleman in just a second. This is the Reverend Jermaine Logan. I asked how many knew and Ed knew. Ed knows a lot, a lot more than I do. He's known as the King of the Underground Railroad. Why? Well, we know he preached in Binghamton for two years. He made his way up through Pennsylvania. He was an itinerary. He was a circuit riding minister. Very common at that time. Uh, eventually, he, his headquarters will be Syracuse as his home base. He's credited with saving over 1,100 slaves. Make their way through central New York and go toward freedom. By the way, he had enough guts they would put ads in the newspaper saying, if you're a runaway slave, come see me, I will help you. Now, here's the problem with that. That wasn't aimed for the slaves. They, most of them couldn't read or write. He was slapping the federal officials saying, come and get me. I thought, okay. He's either very intelligent or not so much. <laughs> Mixed up the rest of my notes. Or it didn't print them out for me. Doesn't matter. I will read. So let's talk about some local stations of the Underground Railroad. We know that in Binghamton, Dr. Stephen Hand was another local station master. That's not Burger Mike, they're a station master. 
and that's him in the middle. He was president of the Broome County Medical Society. You're seeing his home highlighted in yellow. It's the only known image of the building taken from a higher building, but it was at 42 Kyer Street, right where Binghamton City Hall stands today. Now part of the government plaza, and yes, we got a marker up there to denote that. So he was head of the medical society. As again, you're going to see a, a pattern here with these conductors in Chemung County, in Tioga County, in Broome County. These were traditionally white. They were upper middle to upper class. They were educated. They were religious. That seems to be a criteria we see common. As slaves left Binghamton, they made their way along the Shenango River. Again, following one of those national trails. They would stay at the Nathaniel Kenyon House, which is still standing in the beautiful hamlet of where I grew up, or went to school, Shenango Forks. One of those places, if you blink your eye, you're probably better off. <laughs> well, there's not much there now. We either burn it up or blow it down. I used to say Shenango Forks Volunteer Fire Company has a 100% record of saving every basement. <laughs> See you understand that. Now there they be held in a, hidden in a secret compartment. I know I talked about this, but that actually exists. When I this was owned by my high school social studies teacher, Mary Cook. She was about this tall, smoked like a furnace. Don't get in her way. She will run you down and beat you. But she told us this story. And when I was in college, she allowed me to come in. I was much younger and much slimmer and able to crawl in the room, which is now part of a stairway because they renovated it. But it was part of a closet that slid by, and there was literally a tunnel. This was a tavern on the lower level, and there were their residents above that led off to the beautiful Tiaf Nioga River, which, if you look it up, in one book says it means Bank of Many Flowers. We used to say it meant Bank of Many Beer Cans. <laughs> it's a local school. And then from there, they would continue north into Shenango County, eventually reaching the home of Garrett Smith, the fervent abolitionist up in Peterborough and multi-millionaire. Well, they could also cross into the village of Union, Bestville and Union. And there they would stop at one of the umpteen thousand homes. And it's spelled with a C, I did. I see Jackie going, it's S. I know it's an S. Don't tell me. C. Mercer Rose. I know about Joshua and I know about Job. And I, by the way, the two brothers between them had 14 sons and a lot of daughters, so there's a slew of Mercero family, and I apologize for the misspelling. That's a later generation spelling. But which Mercero house? I'm not exactly sure. This is the folklore part of it. And then they would continue through stops, possibly ending in Union Center toward the town of Maine and the hamlet of Maine. Now this is the Cyrus Gates house on what had been the original road. It's been redirected now. It's on in the National Register of Historic Places as a probable station. The Gates family and the later families were very good about self-promoting their importance in the community, as a lot of families do. While we think that slaves probably were hidden, they had, they always told the story of Black Madge, Margaret Cruiser. Look, we, we saved her from slavery. No, never happened. Margaret Cruiser was born a slave to the white Cruiser family in Binghamton, who then, she was manumitted when slavery ended eventually totally by 1828 in New York State. And the family left Binghamton and moved to the town of Vesta. Where did they live? Oh, African Road. <laughs> where there are two other families, and then when she was a young teenager, she moved across the river to the hamlet of Maine and joined the Maine Baptist Church. Yes, she did live and work for them as their servant, 
She was not an escape slave. Did they help them? Yes. In fact, Cyrus Gates' brother, who was the local minister, he was a pro-slavery gentleman who preached that the Bible said slavery was okay. They didn't speak to each other. And by the way, she's buried in the family plot out back of the house, but somebody stole her headstone about 20 years ago. Well, if you leave May and follow Route 26, you're going to end up in Whitney Point. And there we know that they're hidden in the home of George Seymour. We know this to be a fact. This is one of the few that we can prove. By the way, that was for a while called Underground Antiques. I think it's back in private residence now. It needed some help. And again, from Whitney Point, they would continue toward Ithaca and follow along Cayuga Lake. Now, why do we know that? Because their little daughter saw them smuggling the slaves in into the attic. The mother took her aside and said, don't you ever tell anybody what you just saw. We could go to jail. And the little girl never told until she was in her mid-70s. <laughs> and finally gave an interview and said, my parents, I saw them smuggling men, it was men and women, blah, 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 except guess what? Just like every small community in our area, everybody already knew. <laughs> Do you think people in Spencer don't know what's going on down the street? Did you see there was a police car over there? I wonder, Do you have a scanner? <laughs> Wait, that's my house. <laughs> that just happened this week. By the way, that is a fire enclosure, but it might have been a sign. We're not sure, because we don't know how many slaves made their way toward freedom. It's a sign that shows, we're not sure the initials, but the dove of peace, the cross indicating Christian or Christ, a slave's profile and the finger pointing the way north. Few kept written records because it was illegal. And at least several thousand made their way through. How many? Don't pin me down, but I'm going to say between Shimong and Broome counties, over 600. In Tioga, I think our guesstimate was around 400 to 425. Based on fairly well documented routes and stops and the people involved and the time frame. That's about as best as we can do. I'd love to say I can prove it all for all of you. I can't. Now, local slaves, people who were manumitted, struggled, such as the Dorseys, the cruisers who settled, as I said, on African Road in Vestal. This is Thomas Crocker, also known as Obey Tom. He is the first black mayor elected north of the Mason-Dixon line, but you didn't know that. He didn't either. <laughs> he was a slave to Oliver Crocker. Oliver Crocker, some of you may know, that was the IBM Country Club, the house they just tore down. They were slave owners, and he was their slave. He was manumitted and set free and lived throughout his life in the area. He supposedly enlisted in the Civil War and then didn't like it and he walked home three days later. <laughs> well, the trouble was he was in his 50s. We think he actually met his son, did, because we've got his photograph in the Civil War uniform. He ended up his career as a ringing a bell for an auction house, a wrestler. He got arrested a couple times. He was married three times, once the Black Match, had a number of children. And in 1872, during one of our notable elections for mayor in the city of Binghamton, they'd had a contentious election the year before, because there was one year terms. So the Democrats and the Republicans decided they'd run one candidate. Wow. Look at that, the Democrats and Republicans talk to each other. And they were going to run Sherman Phelps. Well, some of you may know the Phelps Mansion on Court Street, next to the library. Sherman Phelps was a very successful businessman. Uh, he was, had a beautiful home designed by Isaac Perry. He was an SOB. And I'll say that out loud. 
when he died, only one newspaper ran a small little obituary for him. He ticked off a lot of his business people. Oh wait, who could vote back then? Women, oh no, women couldn't vote. Blacks, no, no, they couldn't vote. Unproperty people, not really. Oh, it's the white businessmen who can vote, and they didn't like Sherman Phillips. So on the election, they thought it'd be funny to write in somebody else's name on the write-in candidate. And guess what? <laughs> Even according to the newspaper, Obey Tom got X number of votes, another black individual got so many votes, and Sherman Phelps had more. No. <coughs> it was fudged. I know we talk about election and all this stuff now. What happened was they counted the votes and Obey Tom had more votes than Sherman Phelps and we just left them themselves an illiterate black man. Oh my God, what will we do? Well, Richard Daly hasn't been bored yet, but let's try it. We'll just, we'll, we'll just, just, how do we know this has actually happened? The story came out about 20 years later that this occurred. Because the Board of Election Electors refused to sign their name to the certified election results for just the mayor. They signed for Dog Warden, Constable, not for mayor. And then they said, how do you get approval? Because unfortunately, the city election results were housed in the old incinerator near the Binghamton Plaza, and a hobo was in there and dropped a cigarette and burned up a lot of old Binghamton records. Guess who had the microfilm? <laughs> Guess what? Two pages are ripped out of the election designer, the mayor's. Now, did he ever know this happened? Probably not. Um, he spent his death, last days at the Broom County Poorhouse, and he died there. We're not exactly sure where he's buried. But he died in 1884. As did Eli Bell, a former slave who had made his way up, I think, from Virginia or Maryland to, oh, from Maryland and died here in 1907. So some stayed, but not many. And that's going to be the occasion with both Tioga and Shimon as well. <coughs> so who were the station masters? Well, aside from the African Americans, that's a natural. They were white, middle-aged, upper-middle-class Protestants who had a high level, level of education. They understood the issues involved at the time. They also understood the risks involved at the time. We know of only these few, but there's many others. This has been a lifelong search. Local folklore tells us of routes through Windsor, Lyle, other locations. I'm sure you're going to tell me about some in a few minutes. But the very nature of the Underground Railroad makes it difficult to research and very difficult to prove. But the struggle will go on. And that's Follow the North Star. <laughs>
glass or cup that had to be carved out by a slave. They weren't given anything except wood and they had to carve it. That's out. right. And when we were for a while there was the Southern Territory Railroad Historical Society. I was just talking to somebody, this has got us on crest. I was the token white. <laughs> <laughs> And I had no problem with that. I was the vice president, Major Barnett was the president. Sher Professor Sherman Wooden of the University of Scranton was on there, Dr. Beverly Dorsey, Beverly K. James, George Sands out of Chenango County. And Beverly um, found this wonderful cane in a barn in Upper Lyle that we knew was kind of along the route. And the story was that they had hidden slaves, and the slaves, in gratitude, carved the cane out of wood, and it does have slave art on the cane. We could not convince the woman to donate it to the Historical Society. It's sort of like, yeah, it was so close. <laughs> so we wanted to grab it to say, no, you can't have it. It really hit bad to do that. But it was fairly evident by comparing it to other slave carved art, just like you're talking about. So that's that's a very likely story. That's good. But well, tell them to donate. Shimon County Historic Society does a wonderful job out there, and I'm sure they appreciate it. Yep. Yeah. So I've, I've been there for many meetings. Yep. Yeah. I wish I had the bank building. The, the, the bank. Yeah, they're in the bank building. Yes. Yes. Do you think it would go, be too obvious to go to a city like Binghamton? Why wouldn't they stay more on the outskirts of Binghamton? Because As that's where you're going to find the people who have the means to take you in. Okay. I hate to say it, farms are, in most instances, are too distant. Okay. For those who grew up in farming communities where, you know, there's George over here and there's Ed over there. Yeah. Uh, so, and also, most of the routes they're following, the rivers and the railroads, go through larger communities. Makes sense. So that's why. Okay. Yeah. Yes? You said that the first African slave ship came over before the colonists, but why would they have come over? Because people were in Virginia before the Pilgrims. Oh. This is the Jamestown. <laughs> now, were they exactly what we would think of as a wrong term. Modern slave? No. They were cross between slaves and indentured servants. But, yeah, because Jamestown Colony was settled long before Plymouth Colony was. And they'll tell you about it if you ever go down there. <laughs> yes, ma'am? So the shipping of slaves was actually the business? Oh, yes. It's a triangle trade. Molasses to rum to slaves. Oh, what a tangled web we weave. Watch, when I teach my class, I tell them my favorite musical is 1776, which is while it's a musical, it does teach you, and it's fairly close. Yes, uh, English shipbuilders going down to the west coast of Africa and capturing the slaves, bringing them over to America, picking up the rum and molasses from Bermuda and the West Indies, and then doing it all over again. And if you ever see that part, and it's the gentleman from South Carolina yelling at John Adams, which a lot of people did, because he was short and obnoxious and disliked, but instrumental, saying, look at the faces, Mr. Adams, they're white faces, they're New England faces, they're Yankee faces. So nobody was pure from all this going on. And you could cram hundreds of slaves on one ship at a time. And yes, a lot of them would die because you're just you're on a slab of board. Ed. Was there a, an anti-slavery society established in Burke County? Uh, sort of. It, there are there are hints of it. Um, there's an emancipation document that Roger, Luther, and I have used uh, that indicates that there was, we're not quite sure if it's associated with one church or it's just a society on its own. So it's not, it's not as clear as it is in certain areas like Shimon County. Yes? 
Hi. Um, you said that the, this presentation was the result of a few decades of research. Yes. Um, have the findings been published anywhere? Well, if you consider my college paper, <laughs> which, hold on, <laughs> you think I make things up, and I do, as soon as I get it up, <laughs> there have been other things published, oh, lordy I was young. Uh, 1979, hmm, that hurts. The Liberty Line on the Southern New York Underground Railroad in Brotag and Schmunk counties for Professor Huggins. And thank God he's dead now. He wouldn't want to see me doing this. Um, but yeah, that was published, and we've got it on the files under Underground Railroad and our files on the African American Studies at the Broome County Public Library and the Local History and Genealogy Center. Uh, there's been a lot done with the Shimon County Historical Journal, because I stole from that, and a couple of good newspaper articles. It is hard to find. There's some wonderful contemporaneous studies on the Underground Railroad. William Siebert uh, and such, who was actually an escaped slave, wrote about it, and identified a lot of the station masters, but didn't really name too many names in this region of New York State. And why? Because he may not have known of them, because a lot of his stage matches he named were blacks. So it, it's, it, as I said, it takes a lot of sorting out. Ed. I just started uh, reading a book, called, it's called The Republic of Violence. And it uh, talks about the abolition efforts during the 1830s, because that's when it really right. started to get cranked up. Right. And the level of hatred and violence for the abolitionists was extreme. Yes. Uh, the people that were open about promoting uh, the abolition of slavery, they, they were taking their life in their hands. Yes. And there were a number that, that were killed or they were beaten. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so on and so forth. Now, there was a very active anti slavery uh, group established in Weaver. Yes. And it started in 1840. And when they finally got established. Now, there was no local newspaper account, but according to the, the history of Baptist Church, because the Baptist Church was kind of like the, the center for right. abolitionist activity in Oviedo, they said they had a violent mob that you know, threw bricks in the window, and they said, you know, we were fearful for our life yeah. and our physical safety, but they, they went ahead and got uh, established anyway. Um, the one thing I've, I've looked at numerous books about the Underground Railroad, and I never see a weedle listed as a pathway. Exactly. In, in these, these other and I agree. efforts. But in, I think it was 1856, there was an enslaved person <coughs> that came from Oviedo, and it shows up in the Oviedo Times. So that's definite proof oh, that yeah. they came through this area. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think that's part of the issue. It seems like the, the larger communities get named in a lot of these sources, and the smaller ones that were involved get left by the wayside. Um, and I absolutely agree. Yeah, they were taking their life in their hands. Um, and besides risking fines and arrests, just, I'd love to say our society was accepting of blacks coming through. No. It just wasn't. And you can look at the population numbers and understand why in some instances. By the way, I forgot to mention right toward the end, Garrett Smith, uh, after the Civil War, hoping to, to provide land for black colonies, for newly settled blacks, bought acreage in a number of spots around New York State. One of those was in Upper Lyle. If you've never been to beautiful Upper Lyle, <laughs> it's basically under a reservoir and a dam. We wiped most of it up. But he did buy acreage, and we found that he provided the funds for three black families to settle there, and none stayed more than two and a half to three years. The attitude was just... But yet, somehow there was a, an escaped black minister who brought a colony of 
about 12 families up through Susquehanna County settled in the town of Kirkwood, where they owned land sold to them by white owners, which is what you and I are talking about, who took their life in their hands to sell to black individuals. And then he went out west and the colony sort of disbanded. They left Susquehanna County, uh, Susquehanna County because of the attitudes toward them. Some black families made their way into Binghamton. Some made their up the way of Ithaca. And Carol Kamen, who is their historian in Compton's County, has a pair of portraits of a man and woman couple, black, and the names match those that were in the town of Kirkwood. She and I have not gotten together to see if it's part of that group of former escaped slaves who tried to find a place to live. But it's a neat study. But I absolutely agree with everything you just said. It just all makes total sense. But you're right. Finding it mentioned? No. Not in the, <coughs> the published story, sources. Seifert's, Larry Guerra's book, and a bunch of other books. So, so yeah, one other thing I'll talk about is um, the National Park Service has something called the, the Underground Railroad Network of Freedom. They established this about 20 years ago. Right. And um, yes, the, one of the people that established the Anti-Slavery Society in Wigo was Ken Penny. And yes. He, he was at 351 Main Street. Right. And I think he's got the most credibility for being a station master. Makes so, sense. So there's all kinds of oral history. He's very active. Right. He was friends with Frederick Douglass, yep. Garrett Smith, and when the Anti-Slavery Society disbanded yep. in 1870, the newspaper account said it's very likely that Hammond and Penny assessed, assisted sure. in runaway slaves. When he died in 1898, both Duke and Wingo Baker said he, he gave assistance. So yeah. there's, I, I think that and, is very credible. And, yeah, exactly. I was going to say, that's almost as close to proof as yeah. we've got. And I should mention that not everybody who helped them instantly took them into their homes. Sometimes these were secondary families who provided funds or food or clothing for the slaves. Or a place they could hide. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's our secondary group. So, like Ed knows, this, is, this can go on for years, decades, till I die. Well, no, it's not going to go that far. In fact, I'm going to be hearing from the Underground Railroad Museum people at the uh, Museum Associations Conference up in Albany in April. That's one of the presentations I'm going to. I can't imagine why I'd go there and listen to that. <laughs> Anything else? Yes, ma'am. The uh, Center for Anti-Slavery Studies in Montrose is run by Sherman Wooden yes, and his he, wife, so you yeah, know him. Yeah, oh, I know him, yes, and a good man. Mm. Yeah, th they bought one of the two documented station houses in Montrose. Um, by the way, we should say that, that that's a private effort trying to keep going. Uh, the John W. Jones Museum in, a, in um, Elmira is also a private effort looking to expand and build a, a museum attached. So Harriet Tubman House. Um, I don't remember if that, no, that's not on the national parks. I don't know. No, it's not. It's not, is it? Right. Sure, William, uh, William Seward's. No, that's not either. Uh, but you would think, well, in fact, if you ever want to read a, an interesting episode, there's a thing called the Jerry Rescue out of Syracuse. Except the guy's name was not Jerry, but that's OK. <laughs> Escape slave, they put him in jail. The abolitionists, including Garrett Smith and such, broke him out and got him free, but they all got arrested. And it was William Seward, who later became Lincoln's Secretary of State, who defended all those who broke Jerry out of jail. So, in fact, there was about 100 who sort of stormed the jail that night. It's one of those images that I just love to have in my head. So, I saw another hand somewhere. Mark? Um. I understand that in the city of Ithaca, the St. James Ian Zion Church was stopped in Edgar Oh, yeah, it definitely was. I mean, uh, at almost any of the pre existing civil, you know, pre existing before the Civil War, AMEs, churches 
would have been a stop. How active, how much they dare do, that's always a question. But you know, oh yes, I saw a hand over here. This is Frederick Douglass was mentioned. Can you comment on his involvement in the underground world? Um He certainly spoke out about it. He certainly wrote about it. I know he spoke here. Uh, do I think of him as a major figure in the Underground Railroad? Maybe not. Interesting, I'll give a local tie. Reverend Jermaine Logan's daughter, one of his daughters' name was Amelia. Amelia taught at the first black school of Binghamton uh, for about two years. And then she went off and moved up first to Syracuse with her father, and then she moved out to Rochester, and she ended up marrying Lewis Douglas, the son of Frederick Douglass. For those who don't know, watch the movie Glory. That role is portrayed by Morgan Freeman. And for those of us who think of Morgan Freeman, he's God. <laughs> this is Morgan Freeman. Yeah, perfect when goes by fine. Uh, when I went down years ago, I was curating the local Civil War exhibit at Robertson. It was going to be 4,000 square feet, big exhibit. My friend and I went down and stayed in Gettysburg. Don't do it in August when it's 99 degrees out. And they run out of bottled of water. They're advising people do not walk the battlefield because the people are dropping. But I wanted to see the brand new then visitor center. And National Parks always have an orientation film give you the semblance. And I walk in there and the thing goes dark and all of a sudden you hear, and then they can. Or I thought, oh God, it's Morgan Freeman. He's a, it's like James Earl Jones. Just get one or the other. Uh, but Frederick Douglass, yeah, I don't, I'll be honest, I don't know if there was more extensive involvement or not. Yes? I grew up in Montrose, a um, block and a half from um, Judge Isaac's uh, book. Post. Post right. house. And um, yes, he kept a diary, but apparently, and it, they, the slaves apparently were kept in, in the, uh, or hidden in the attic. Right. And his diary would say how many men or women, but never a name. Oh, no, no, no. Like that. Also, we had an AME church, and this past yes. December, uh, with the uh, Christmas in Montrose, they had, for the first time this year, um, it was a historical. Um, tour of the churches, but the first one was the AME yeah, church, yeah. and apparently there was a pastor of that church, black pastor of course, had nine children. Apparently his oldest son was the pastor of Harriet Tubman up in Auburn, okay. and one of his daughters uh, yes. apparently married um, Frederick Douglass's daughter. Yeah. Also, if anybody listens to WPEL for the last, that's the Christian radio station out of Montrose, for the last three weeks, the current judge, um, Jason Legg, spoke about Judge Jonathan Wright, first black judge in the U.S., mm -hmm. and he um, got a certification for the Montrose Courthouse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Montrose wasn't terribly accepting, and he ended up going down south. Um, it always yeah. fits the pattern, it yeah. seems to me. But you had Galusha grow in there. Yes, we did. Yes. And I grew up with grow out For those who don't know, why don't you? No. <laughs> Galusha grow was Speaker of the House during the Civil War mm. and responsible for the Homestead Act. For those who remember that movie with Tom Cruise and his then wife as they go across the Midwest trying to grab the land that was going to be available for free, that's the Homestead Act. Mm. Other questions? Otherwise, we'll never go home. <laughs> Peter. Yes, uh, one of your books downstairs, uh, the Marnie Schrader Civil War Letters book. Yes. Uh, it, it sort of gives a bit of the other side. Uh, I mean, undoubtedly, uh, the, uh, the anti-abolitionists uh, were very active, but I, I'm not sure we talk enough about uh, uh, the, the we we'll call them patriots now, but uh, there are, uh, these Civil War letters talk about giving the copperheads their comeuppance. Yes. Uh, so uh, while it's fashionable to talk about uh, uh, beating up the, the people trying to save the slaves, uh, there was 
Title Bay County in the way was, was more Republican. In 1964, uh, there was less than half a percent uh, uh, split for Lincoln versus McClellan. Uh, McClellan. Oh. Interesting. And that, that, that helped through statewide. Yeah. This will be the last question. Because I'm getting tired of seeing it. More of a comment. When you see, you hear these stories about all the things that yeah. slaves did to escape, it's very clear that next to life itself, there's nothing so precious as freedom. Yes. Yeah. The, the Which is why we just to have freedom. Right. And how complex it is. It doesn't come free either. That's the problem. Let me forget. All right. I thank you all for coming. Side plus the Empire Saxophone Quartet. If you're not a member,